So you can see I've gone with a very simple, a very simple drawing. And you can get it a little wrong and it'll still look okay. I think I've drawn mine higher than the original painting. Whenever you're putting objects on a canvas, you want those objects to be to be cheated downward. You don't want them to be too high on the canvas because they will look like they're floating. So if you don't get them dead center so much, although this is pretty close to dead center, cheat them down a little bit because that makes them look as if they've got weight. So remember that. Now, when you're doing what I'm doing right here with this vine charcoal, this is the moment <laughs> to step back and look at your work. Because right now we've got it sketched. This is what your charcoal is for. It's to do your loosey-goosey sketch of whatever it is that you're about to paint. And I cannot tell you the 6,000 times that I have done paintings where, you know, I'll just labor over this drawing for hours and hours. And at the end of it, I finally stop to have my lunch break and I realize everything's about three quarters of an inch too high on the canvas. Or, oops, everything needs to go over by an inch and a half. You know, you've done that, right? <laughs> I hear you. Okay, this is the part of the process that you have to force yourself to do slowly. So this is the part where you want to play music and back up and look at it and study it, maybe go out of the room for a while, come back in. You want to, it's your composition, it's where you're composing your painting. I'm going to make this line a little higher, okay, and I'm going to figure out where, actually, um, I, I'm about a half inch too high, but we kind of don't care. It's sort of okay. And then the back of the table is going to be back here. And I'm going to, you know, keep this very fuzzy. Now, when you're doing this, for heaven's sakes, what you don't want to do is you don't want to take a, a compass or something and make perfect circles. First of all, the face of this is not really a circle. It's a little bit of an ellipse. And also, if you make this a perfect circle, it's not going to look like a grapefruit, it's going to look like a rubber ball. <laughs> so this, that's another reason to do this. Now, grapefruits are, they have some weight so that they'll flatten a little bit on the bottom. You want to, you know, make sure that you've got enough of that. Okay, so that's sort of okay. This is a water-soluble pencil. They're also called watercolor pencils. I'm going to say it very slowly <laughs> because it's not the same thing as a colored pencil. And so what happens is people go to the art supply store and they get a colored pencil and they, they think it's going to work. And what happens is they lose their drawing because they didn't make absolutely sure that what they had was a watercolor pencil. The other thing is don't buy the cheapy store brand. Now, you want to get two colors. And you want to get like a brown of any type, any type of brown. This happens to be Van Dyke brown. You could get burnt umber, it, just a, a earth color, a brown. Uh, and then you also want to get one in black, and I'll show you why. Now here we have our drawing. And this could be a drawing of a very, could be a charcoal vine drawing of a very complicated thing. It doesn't matter, but we're just doing something simple. So what, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take my uh, watercolor pencil and I'm going to draw right through the charcoal onto the canvas. So I'm just going to do this and I'm not going to worry about being terribly perfect about it. I'm just going to get the stuff on the canvas. 
And let me tell you, if your imprimatura has just been put on the canvas like the day before, this will stain the canvas and you won't really be able to wipe it off. But if the imprimatura has been dry for days and days, you should be able to do that. Okay. Now, when I went to art school a thousand years ago, we just did a charcoal drawing and then we just started painting. You know, well, you can see with charcoal drawing, I mean, unless you're using a sharpened charcoal pencil, you can't even get a very detailed drawing, right? And so what this does is it will enable you now to get a very detailed drawing. So, okay, you have this really pale drawing. Now you come in with your black pencil. And, you know, like normally I would, I would take the, the brown pencil and I would say, okay, so here's going to be... I, I, basically what I'm saying is I'd add more detail. Now with your black drawing, and, and usually you make a bunch of changes to your charcoal and you do the brown and you make changes to that. When you get the drawing really where you want it to be, this is why you use the black. Because there might be four outlines here that are brown. And if you start painting, you're going to forget which one of those outlines was the one that you wanted. So. Now that you know, okay, this is actually where I want this to be. And you want, uh, some of this stuff depends on how good you are. But you want a pretty, a fairly dark line. You know, you guys should be able to see it back there. You may not have been able to see uh, what I just put on there before because it's kind of pale. And you don't want to skip the black pencil because we're about to put a glaze over this thing. And if I had stuck with just this brown, the glaze, you won't be able to see your drawing. So you want it to be pretty darn dark. You don't have to get absolutely crazy about it, but you want it to be reasonably dark. Now, when you make a hard line, you'll notice I just kind of made these little scratchy lines there. When you make a hard line, that's a lot harder to cover up than a vague line like that. So you want to be a little careful on things like your back horizon line of the table. Or if I were doing a landscape and this was the distant horizon, I wouldn't want a real hard line there because I like to keep that kind of soft and fuzzy in the painting. And so it's harder to cover up a real intense line like one of these. So this is another thing. You do your charcoal pencil, you stop, you study, you decide whether or not you got it right, whether or not you need to move things around the canvas, up, down, whatever. Maybe put something else in the painting or take something out of the painting. It's the part where you're doing your composition. Now, normally you, you do your composition by doing a bunch of sketches, thumbnail sketches. I just cut right to the chase because life is short and I'm going to die pretty soon. I just don't have time to be doing all this stuff. But that means that I have to make changes as I go along. So uh, uh, this is another place. Actually, the brown drawing would be another place to stop back up, go get yourself some coffee, come back and look at it, because you don't see your mistakes as you're making them. It's just like life. You see it <laughs> afterwards. So you'll see a mistake in a composition the next day. You won't see it the day you make the mistake, most of the time. Now we have what we consider to be our acceptable drawing. Now we're going to do something very interesting called a wipeout glaze. This should be, I hope, on your next page. Yes? I'm just using burnt umber. That's all. And I've got turpentine or turpenoid in it. So turpenoid and burnt umber for this. Always start away from your drawing in order to make sure that you're not too dark. See, I was a little bit dark there. So I reached down here and I grabbed a little bit more turp and put it into the mixture so that hopefully I'll get something that won't be too terribly dark. Did you put the liquid in it too? No, I didn't. Yeah. Just turn. Some people will, especially on a bigger painting, a lot of folks have this wipeout part of the process. Um, 
Now, what did you write them down? Oh, wait a second. Uh, this part of the process, for some people, the turp starts to dry too quickly. So then you can put liquid in it to keep it open longer if you think you need more time for what I'm about to do. Uh, as I'm applying this, I have to make sure, and I bet you can't even see the drawing from there, can you? Uh, I have to make sure that I'm not washing the drawing off. So one of the things I can do is this is a very forgiving part of the painting, okay? Very. So I put more turp in there to try to make it a little bit. So I start away from the drawing, and then when I go over the drawing, what I'm looking for is I'm looking to make sure my lines are not being washed off. If my lines are being washed off, then you probably have a pastel pencil or something other than a water-soluble pencil. The reason this works is because the pencil that you are using is water soluble, but it's not oil soluble, and therefore, and therefore, it stays on the canvas. One of the things I want to do is I'm just blotting a little bit because I got it too wet. If you see it weeping down the canvas, it's too wet. So what you need to do is put more paint into the mixture. And then you're trying to get a very thin coat on here. Now you can see the canvas is, is quite dark. I'm going to do the wipeout. This is the purpose of this brown stuff, okay? I'm going to wipe out everywhere that the light strikes these, these grapefruits. So I know that the light is striking the face of this grapefruit. <coughs> And I know that the light is striking the table. How do you know that? You see that. Okay. Just from looking at the picture. And hang on, because I will talk to you about it. I know that the light is striking the back grapefruit. but only on the side of the grapefruit where it's facing toward the light. It's not striking the grapefruit back here. Now, if you wipe out some part of this that should not have been wiped out, you know, you didn't, like right here on that grapefruit, then you can just reapply wipe out plates. Okay, not a problem. You just take Hey, take the same brush and just brush right back over it. So if you you can also use a brush with a little bit of turf on it in order to further wipe out. So I'm just brushing some of some of the wipeout blaze back on. Okay. So now I have a pretty good map of what is called the simple light, which is simple light is just light mass, shadow mass. Where is the light striking the objects? And where is the light not striking the objects? Can you guys see the, what's happening here? So now we have resolved the uh, uh, problem of composition. We have mapped the light. Where is the light striking the object? You'll notice there's no reflected light that's recorded in this. This is just simply where does the light directly strike and where does the light no not directly strike. And I have made an effort to keep, well, this side needs to come up some. I've made an effort on the tabletop to keep that back area very fuzzy. And this can be a little bit sharper. Now, you can work on this stage of the painting for, I don't know, an hour or two if you wanted to. You could, you could do that. But it's kind of a waste of your time to do that. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to mix up the colors that we will use for the next area. The color of the grapefruit. Uh, first of all, I'll mix up the local color that you see on page six, which is yellow ochre, white, cad yellow, deep, and lizard crimson. Ah, God, I mean, just super hard to mix. 
yellow ochre and the, and the bright yellow. I put some white in it. So if you use the titanium white and you wanted it more buttery, you would add? Add a few drops of the turf of to thin it down, or you can add a few drops of your medium liquid fine detail. It's, it, at that point and on your first layer of paint, you can go either way. Okay. You don't have to use medium necessarily. Now, when you are mixing a color, take your knife and just put it right on top of the color. Do you see that the color I've mixed is greener? Yeah. Can you see that? Then you're checking for the temperature. So I'm going to put a little bit of alizarin crimson. When you are putting a color into a batch like that, and all you're looking to do is really change the, the temperature, be very careful. You just I just put in like an amount of alizarin crimson that amounted to like one quarter of an English pea. It's strong, good paint. So one of the problems you're going to have in mixing colors is you grab up a bunch on your knife and all of a sudden you have this pile of red paint. And you think, oh boy, now I've wasted that. You know? so, so be careful with it. You can always add more. You can't get it back out again. So. Uh, a little dark, yeah. mm -hmm. so we're going to add some more white. So what you can do is, these booklets are nice, and I did not want to just hand you a pile of paper because it just gets all over the place. And you know, mm -hmm. what you really, uh, what what I, my, what my students like to do is they don't get them bound like this, they put them in plastic sleeves, and then you can actually take your knife and you can actually put some paint on the plastic sleeve and then you just wipe it off. But you can check to see if it matches that way. If you have it in a book like we do, then you want to lay it on top like this. It had, when you're doing this, make sure that it's parallel to the page so that the light is affecting the color in the same way. If you do this, you're gonna get a misread because the light's going to hit it more strongly. If you do it like this, it's going to be in shadow. Or if you rock it this way, it's going to be in shadow. So you've got to keep it parallel to and close to the page. And that's close enough. You know, that's the other thing. Don't sweat this stuff, guys. You're just trying, you're trying to convince people they're looking at a grapefruit, so you don't want it to be lime green. You, know, you want it to be sort of a grapefruit color. Okay. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take my lightest light and put it here so that the video can see what I'm, what I'm grabbing. Okay. The table farther I'm right to the right sometimes. <laughs> I'm not kidding. You people are going to be seeing me in the nursing home. <laughs> When Ma was there, we always made jokes about we were going to get bunk beds. <laughs> <laughs> she was missing a leg, so she was automatically going to get the one on the bottom. <laughs> Otherwise, I was going to have to hoist her up. Okay, so I'm going to pick up my lightest color right here. And I'm going to put it where the lightest part of that back grapefruit is. And I think you will notice I'm going to use very little of value one. So as you're mixing, if you think, oh, I have like next to nothing of value one. You need next to nothing of value one. That's okay. Usually your lightest light, there's not a whole lot of it that you use. Okay, so now I'm going to surround that by the next value. That value is not dark enough. Mm -hmm. I can see that. You see from where you are. It does. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to use my darkest one as my number two value. And I'm going to see, I can see mm -hmm. that. You should be able to see that it has taken a step down in value. So that's why I'm saying when you get to working on yours, if you mix what you see in the workbook and it doesn't work, fix it, adjust it, stop what you're doing. I'm going to uh, take my number three value, I'm going to put some more yellow ochre in it. A little bit of, of a lizard crimson. I'm just trying to get it to be darker. Uh, I'm going to put some, oh, let's put a little bit of our burnt umber to darken it even further. 
So you're always adjusting. Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much. Yes. So, you know, don't get too roped in uh, when you're working from these books. I went out of my way at Kinko's to check the colors to get them to be pretty good. You know, if not absolutely perfect, then at least they're, they're not bad. Right. That's why I'm saying no matter what you do on your palette, you don't know until you actually start putting it up here. So, okay, that's... So you have to adjust your darkest dark. Yeah, I made my darkest dark, my number three value, I darkened it, and I put a little bit of uh, burnt over into it. Now I'm grabbing a little bit of alizarin, putting a little bit of alizarin to warm that up because that is looking... Mm -hmm. Now, what I'm doing here, guys, is I am putting paint on very slightly thicker than what I would do normally on one of my paintings. Because normally, on one of my paintings, I actually have two underpaintings. Because I am, I'm going to make the number two value wider. See, I don't think I brought it out far enough, so I can just paint it. On top of what I had there before. So can you start to see, it's already starting to make the form turn. What creates the illusion of form is, quite simply, value. So I'm mixing a number four, uh, now it's a number five shade. I'm making that a little bit darker. And you'll see in the book I do add a darkest, another darker shade back here. Just before the light mass turns into shadow mass, there is this area right here that is called the transition tone. And it means it's transitioning from light mass to shadow mass. And that's it, that number four? Yeah. Okay. In the book, it'll be number four. We kind of, I sort of yeah. adjust it. But just remember, guys, if it doesn't look right, then stop and adjust it. Mm -hmm. You know, fix it. And mm -hmm. use your own good judgment. Now, here's a problem that a lot of folks have. And that is when you, <coughs> right here, this is the cast shadow. This is the shadow that this grapefruit is casting onto this grapefruit. A cast shadow can be a fairly sharp transition, but a form shadow, here's the form shadow right here. A form shadow is where the light mass rotates away from the light source and becomes shadow mass, okay? And this, you want to be very fuzzy. You don't want a sharp, transition into shadow mass. You want it to be fuzzy. So be sure that you do that. All right, let's go to Okay, now I'm going to move into doing the uh, uh, face of this one. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this number one value and I'm going to put more white in it. Because the pith is a very pale shade of whatever the skin is. So on an orange, it's kind of a peachy color. And uh, on a lemon, it's a very pale uh, yellow. So now I'm going to go all around the outside where the if, yes. if I need to put a little touch of uh, turp into my mixture, by the way, I forgot to put the mixture up here where we can all see it at home. So this is the pith color. All I did was I took this color and put more white in it to come up with this. 
I did put a little bit of turf on my brush and then just kind of grab the paint and smush it around a little bit so that it's a more uh, flowing thing. I dipped my brush again into the turf and smooshed it around in the pith color. And you wouldn't think that you would start on this outside pith, but you're going to see why I'm doing this in a minute. Okay. I'm going to mix uh, the colors for the inside, the meat of the, of the cut grapefruit. Okay, so I'm going to use this as the innermost area of meat. One that's around the center. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the one that's around the center. Okay. And then we've got a fairly orangey, and it's just that chrome yellow, really, with some of the outside uh, color, some of the number two color, and some alizarin crimson to make a fairly orange color there. And then I'm going to do. A lot of alizarin crimson. And by the way, this this is <laughs> you may have noticed this is a pink grapefruit. It's not <laughs> a regular yellow grapefruit. Okay, so these are the three colors that I'll use for the meat of of that. Um, <coughs> Of this cut grapefruit. Now, have you used any of those original colors in this, or you you are now moving out of the limitation? Of uh, no, the... I'm all on the same palette. I'm only using the colors that you guys have listed in the book. Okay. I might be mixing them a little differently, but they're I'm not I'm not adding. I have not added another tube of color. I mean, are you still using cad yellow? Yeah, I'm using. Well, actually, what I'm using is chrome yellow, which you should have on your list. Chrome yellow is a great color for this stuff. We have cad yellow light. Or, I, I don't think I've used cad yellow yet. Yeah. Cad yellow cad deep yellow we have. That's what's on my It's pretty interchangeable with chrome. Okay. So you okay. can use really either one. Okay. Thank you. I'm going to uh, paint around what I know will be the open center of this thing mm -hmm. with my uh, number one color. And this is not so much, this is this painting, unlike most of my paintings, is fairly direct. So this particular part of the painting, it is a light, medium, and dark color, but it has less to do with value because all I'm doing is I'm painting what is a flat surface. So I'm not trying to make you think that this thing is moving through space. So this is uh, an almost unusual part of the painting where I'm really not uh, worried about uh, the value of this thing. What I'm worried about is the color. And I notice you're painting round shapes. I mean, it, it, like it's like the shape is round. You're not worrying about the sections. And I can see them. No, no, don't don't think about the sections yet. But I am going to show you. Um, I'm mixing these two together to get a little more, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, I like this better. I'm mixing that more intense one with the middle one, because I thought that uh, this one right here is getting a little too dark and red. And, you know, use your judgment. You're going to match the colors that are in the book, and then you're going to, you know, one of the hardest things I have to try to get people to do is to actually look at what they're doing, you know, and if something looks wrong to you, it's, it's wrong. Fix it. You know, change it. You're not, this uh, booklet is a guide, but it's not, you know, a legal document that's holding you to exactly whatever you see. Okay, now I can start to think in terms of the sections. 
And the easiest way to do those sections, and I talk about this in the little booklet, is to think of them, it's a little bit like your teeth, you know, when they come up here, they, they make U shapes up into the pith. So you'll take your whatever your darkest one was that you wound up using. And you're just going to push up the sort of U shape. And they, you don't even want them all to be perfectly matched. So if one or two, do you see that sort of starting to happen there? Okay, and you'll also notice what I did here was the first step is this U shape. And it's not hard, guys. Uh, you just kind of push up and don't let yourself get crazy and go all the way through to the far side of the pith. You actually want these little U-shapes to be different from one to the next anyway, you know? And you don't want to create two mechanical, you know, you don't want three that are exactly the same size and then one big one and then three that are exact. So the, the idea is to create, to create something that looks like nature did it, you know, just very arbitrary. You run into this in all of painting, but you really run into this in landscape painting. When you're doing, you know, trees or bushes or just anything, you can, if you're not careful, you can wind up with something that doesn't look natural, but looks as if it's been orchestrated. Because really, truly, that's, that's, it's, it's something that your brain uh, wants you to do. And so you have to sort of overcome that tendency. So that, I hope, gives you, and now, you know, it's not a one-shot thing. You can, you can come back and add a little more pith. But you also are going to take your brush, and this is where you probably want to rotate your canvas because it's just easier to do this pith thing if you're dragging it toward the center. And you don't really want those lines to go all the way to the hub of your wheel. You want them to just sort of, some of them will be more pronounced, some of them will be real short. It's okay. Now, another thing I'm gonna do is I'm going to paint the center of the grapefruit. Uh, so I'm going to grab a little bit of cad red light and let's mix it with our middle tone so that it's not fluorescent looking. <laughs> and I'm going to just sort of paint it up. I do. I need to add it to the darkest tone, not the middle tone, so I can paint the hole in the middle. At least to get it started. Now, another thing you can do is, you know, you have these three areas of color. You can sort of keep wiping your brush out and just grab it and just sort of drag it out. You see how that just gives you the slightest hint of that texture. And I will tell you guys, when you do this stuff, it, there, there's not a rule that says that you can't let this dry and come back and work on it another day. It's actually easiest if you do, because that's really indirect painting. I tried to do this particular painting as directly as I possibly could. Yeah. yeah. All right, so I just took the darkest uh, light mask color and I put more alizarin crimson in it, but mostly I put burnt umber into it. So let's see. That's going to be, yeah, that'll be my darkest color. And I, I know this is probably hard for you to see because what's happening as I'm putting this on, this is the same value as where I'm placing it. So it's going to be almost invisible to you uh, unless you come on up, which you're welcome to do. Uh, 
know, one of the things that I think personally, I'm going to take some of my lighter color and mix in here so that I get a little bit lighter in my shadow mass. Yeah, that's good. take the darkest and put that into this shadow mass. Now, this is a typical issue of um, this and this are just grouping together and I want this to be, uh, a cast shadow tends to be slightly darker than a form shadow. So I'm going to make, I'm going to put a little tiny bit of black into this mixture and I don't want to confuse you because usually 99% of the time you do not use black to darken a color uh, because black is basically blue. But in this particular uh, mix, black works just fine because it will make this darker and it will make it greener and that's okay. Most of the time you do not want to use black to go darker. Black. But uh, any black, you have to think of black as being blue. And if you doubt that, take your black, put some white in it, add some yellow and you'll get green. Now, I've got to lighten here. I'm going to lighten this hopefully quite a bit uh, because this is reflected light. Now you'll notice when you start mapping uh, your symbol light, you know, when you're, when you're doing a wipeout, the temptation is to white out the reflected light. And uh, I understand that temptation, but you can't let yourself do it. Reflected light is still shadow mass, okay? And you have to make yourself uh, work with it in that way because your forms won't group properly. Please do that because it will pay off for you. Yeah, that's straight black. This is lamp black. And I, have, Mary can tell you, I have a lot of black background <laughs> on my paintings. Uh, and people love them. They're very, mm -hmm. it looks a little more contemporary, which isn't really true because it's very Dutch. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it makes them look old. It may, well, I see, to me, it makes them look highly, mm -hmm. it's like highly dramatic. Mm -hmm. And I really am a little bit of a drag queen. Mm -hmm. So if I can go for the drama, I do only drag queen highlights. They are so, they're like 10 times whatever the real highlight is. Because if I'm going to have a highlight, I want everyone to see that I have a highlight. So uh, I, I exaggerate my highlights, and I love that because life should sparkle more than it does. Don't you think? Mm -hmm. yes. Yes. My mom had a thing about, you know, anything sparkly, you know, rhinestones, you know, buy your jacket, it had to have sparkly stuff on it. <laughs> uh, so I got that from her. So if you don't like it, it's her fault. <laughs> She's not available to discuss it anymore. So Now, keeping this back area very fuzzy, ain't that easy, but it can be done. I'm putting a little bit of turf on my brush so that this flows a little bit better. Um, and if you uh, just go that far with your background, everybody will think you're very hard to see. Um, I generally finish them. But what happens is, when you do this, you get, uh, you'll put, you'll be pulling black paint off and you'll get it on this and you'll get it all over you, blah, blah, blah. So I like going just so far, you know, up to the edge, unless I am in my studio. Now this is the part that you really want to 
sit up and take notice of. Don't be shy. Get up and get close if you need to. I'm going to start controlling the edges of the back grapefruit. This is the thing that is uh, that creates it, uh, 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 the ability to finesse your paintings. So it's very important to have somebody, and, and guys, you know, you're not born with these skills. Somebody has to show you, and then you have to practice. But if nobody ever shows you, you're not going to invent this stuff on your own. You know, somebody taught Leonardo. All right. Now, I'm taking a brush that is a filbert, and it's blown out. You know, once they get blown out, once they go like that, it is now a blender. <laughs> So, uh, I don't know if this is the one that will work, but I will try it because I didn't bring, I didn't bring a brush that was beat up enough for what I needed. So you're looking for a soft, fuzzy edge. Now, do you see what I'm doing? I am tickling the surface. I don't know if you can see it from back there. Can you see how that got fuzzy? Yes. Okay. This is... It's a dry brush. You can have, if you put turf on it, you're going to start, you're going to start lifting off paint. You see that? This is a beautiful effect in a painting. You've got to make sure you've got some sharp edges, you've got some fuzzy edges. Uh, and the further back the edge is, the fuzzier you'll want it to be. Now, I forgot to talk about this when I was doing it, but when you're putting a black background on, you start applying the paint away from the edge of the form, and then you push the paint up to the edge. And one of the things that will help you do is not get a bead of black paint that, that shows that edge. Never, ever leave that bead of paint there. Get it back off. Because what it does is it flattens the form, it destroys the illusion. And it, when this thing is on your wall and the light is hitting it at an angle, that bead of paint will show up and it'll drive you crazy. And once it's dry, you're stuck with it. So as you paint, you want to constantly have the habit of checking the edges of these forms. Oh, I'm doing such a good job. I can't. It might look like hell from back there from up here. It's beautiful. <laughs> Okay, just so you know. Uh, now, the edge of this cast shadow needs to be a little soft. So softening, like you're doing, would take care of that beaded edge? Yes, softening would take care of the beaded edge, but you really want to get in the habit of not putting it there to begin with. Because here's what can happen when you start to soften, if there's a big bead of paint, you can wind up with black all over the place, and it'll drive you crazy. The other trick to any kind of blending or softening is constantly wiping your brush back off. You've got to get whatever the paint is you just got on it, you've got to get it back off again. Um, and if you don't really want to soften an edge, you just want to knock down the bead, then don't tap as much as drag. Drag the brush along that edge. If you very carefully, repeat that again. I'm just dragging and wiping. If I want to get rid of a bead, the other thing this does is it marries the two edges, but it doesn't. It doesn't make it real fuzzy. It will make it a little bit fuzzier than it was. It will soften a little bit, but it won't, it won't do that. So the more you tap and jiggle, the fuzzier it will get. And what you don't, don't ever, like right here, I have those different values, right? Now what I'm going to try to do is I'm going to blend them. Now, what I see students do all the time is they'll take a brush and they'll just go all over, and, there, and then there's no different values, right? So when you've been working with black, as I have, it really gets into your brush, so really wipe that brush out pretty thoroughly. Now, in between value 2 and value 3, I can see an area where it jumps, and all I'm doing is tapping and brushing it on my paper towel. 
and tapping and brushing. And I'm staying along the seam between the number two, or no, actually this is the number three and the number four. This is that transition idea that I used. Keep wiping your brush. Right here, as I said before, where it turns into shadow mass, I want a very soft transition. Now, remember I was saying I was really kind of lathering the paint on a little bit thicker than what I normally do. That's because I know that I'm going to come back and do this tapping and that the act of doing that tapping is going to pick some paint back up. So I want good opaque coverage and I want to give myself the room to come back and do a little bit of tapping. Now, now I'm going to start on the tabletop. Let's try this. You're going to mix up a range of grays, you know, light, medium, dark. When you are painting uh, a tabletop, this is, uh, you know how I talked about, you have different values that create the illusion of a form that's turning in space. You also have uh, flat surfaces, planes that are traveling through space, and maybe it's a background that you are thinking of as being a, hor uh, a vertical plane. Maybe it's a tabletop that is a horizontal plane, right? And so it's easy to get the thing going this way. It's hard to get your viewer to perceive a tabletop as traveling back in space, and even more so if they can't see the sides of the table. You know, so you do that with a couple of tricks of the trade. One of them is you keep the back edge very fuzzy to one degree or another uh, so that it looks like it's further away than the front edge. And the other thing is through the use of values. I'm going to use one of these angle brushes. I love those. I know that they're gimmicky. I don't care. <laughs> I will use a toothbrush if it does the job. I just don't believe in being snobby about Paintbrushes. Be snobby about something else. <laughs> Paintbrushes. Okay, so I'm going to start out with my lightest light on this flat plane that I'm hoping to get to convince the viewer is traveling back in space. So I'm going to start right up close to the forms. Are you touching paint on the form? Or are you yes, I am. And this is a scary thing for most people. Um, I'm gonna, by the way, I think that that one that I mix is a little too light. So I'm gonna mix some of my darker one into it. It's because I just think it's too close to looking white on the canvas. Uh, yeah, something that's very hard for people is where the edges of paint mix. And so what happens is they get scared and they stop <laughs> before they even get to the edge. So I got two things for you. One of them is mall stick. Mall stick will steady your hand so that you can get right up to an edge. And the other thing is start away from the form and then push up to that edge and drag it sort of along that edge. Got too much paint on my brush. Sneak up on it. Sneak up on it. You bet, baby. Good. Now, the lightest light on your table will most probably be in two, two places that you can predict. One is right outside a cast shadow, uh, and the other one is right along the front edge of the table. And you want your, your values to change kind of quickly. Now, I'm going to a darker value, and I'm, I'm just going to blend it as I go, even. So I'm at the number two value on the table. Guys, what happens, this is that fuzzy back edge. You use a darker and darker gray as you get back to that edge. And of course, one of the huge challenges is keeping that back edge level, which I'm probably not doing because I'm you see I'm sitting off to the side. Mm -hmm. So forgive me. If the, the grapefruits look like they're gonna roll downhill, just let me know and I'll try to fix it. But 
you know, I'm, I'm just not terribly concerned about it. But if it were a studio painting, I'd be very careful to keep. And I don't care if you started out measuring it, it was perfectly level. It's one of those things that changes as you go. So just because you checked it once doesn't mean you don't need to check it again. You probably do. So I'm lightening it just as it comes up to the edge. And you can see this. You can see this in your book, in your photographs. Now, there are lots of areas with me you know, being right on top of this painting. There are lots of areas where I can see um, the imprimatura, the original tone of the canvas showing through. When I, when I first started teaching these workshops up here, believe it or not, I really am shy. <laughs> I, I, people always laugh when I say that. Um, but I, when I don't know people, uh, oh, I consider having, you know, a, an opening of my paintings just torture. I'd rather you just no, threw me in front of a movie train. Time. I just hate it. Because I got nothing to say about my paintings. If you can't look at them and sort of get it, at least I can't help you. Um, okay, now, yeah, it's a grapefruit. What do you want out of it? <laughs> it's not a political statement. It's just a grapefruit. Okay, now I'm going to take a small brush, which I happen to have. I have a small fuzzy brush. Okay, now I'm going to take even more blue black, and I'm going to mix it into my darkest gray uh, because I need a shadow, a shadow color. Okay. Now, cast shadows do predictable things. First of all, they're darkest where they're closest to the object that is casting them. And the edges of cast shadows are sharper when they're closer to the, the object casting them. So they get fuzzier and paler as they travel away from the object. They get darker and sharper as they get closer to the object. And this is predictable stuff. This is pretty consistent, you know, stuff that once you know that, you will see it. Once you know it, you'll look at it and go, oh my gosh, I never noticed that before. But it's true. I'm taking some of my paler color and I'm just coming back in and lightening this area further back in the shadow. The front edge. The front edge of a table. And you're going to see this if you do a fair amount of still life painting. Uh, uh, very often, the front edge of the table is pretty much the same value as the top of the table. But if you want it to look like it drops down, yeah. you have to make it almost the color of your shadows. Maybe not quite, but it's got to be darker. And I've tried doing it the other way. You know, I've tried painting it really as I saw it. And it's fine. It can be okay. But I just find it's so much easier to read if you just basically lie and make it darker. So um, you just saw me do this with the shadows, too. I'll start out very dark, and then I'll come back in and lighten it up to the degree that I can get away with lightening it up. The trick is keep wiping your brush out. Just really wipe it out. If you actually switch chroma, wash your brush out in the turf. But if you're just changing value, wipe your brush out and you're fine. 
Uh, if I was, I would never be working on this and then come up here and grab my yellows and, you know, then I would be in some serious trouble. My lightest light again. I'm going to come back and hit that front edge. Do you see how this hit of the lightest light really does sharpen that edge and make it, make it turn? You see that? It's just a value thing. <coughs> now, if this were a cloth instead of this, you know, marble cutting board, uh, then it's a slightly it, that that whitest that lightest light on the edge, then it would really need to be wider, you know, and then blend it on the top and blend it on the bottom because when a cloth comes over and drops. It does do that. It gets much lighter right on the turning edge uh, and it gets blended on the top and the bottom. If you have something like this where you're really trying to make a fairly sharp transition, uh, then it's a little bit, then it's then it's a less blending. Whenever you have a trouble, I'm going to enlarge this triangle because I like it and I want it to be now that's something I would say, if I had been paying a little closer attention when I did my initial drawing, I would have made sure that that, that open mm -hmm. negative space there where that little triangle of light was going to show was just bigger because it's pretty. Mm -hmm. So, and also I want, I'm tapping along the edge of that back grapefruit because I need that edge to be very fuzzy. Ideally speaking, it would be even fuzzier than the edge, the transition between this space, that form, and that negative space. It should be fuzzier on that back shape than on the forward shape. Now, I'm grabbing uh, light mass values here, and I'm going into this cast shadow area. And it's okay for me to do that. You know, one of the big rules of thumb on painting is don't ever put a light mass value into the shadow mass. But if you're mixing it into wet paint, that's different. You're going to get something in between. Uh, Let's take a very dark gray. I'm going to take my darkest gray. I'm going to uh, put even more black into it. And let's try a distort. I haven't done this uh, veining thing since I did that painting, so. <laughs> I'm like, screw it up. All right, so let's see. And this is where it kind of helps you if you've ever done any faux finish work. You're going to be able to do this better. Um, I don't know why, because I thought that this is something that the students would just have a terrible time doing. So I was very uh, quick to say that. Got a round. This is like a number five round. You know, it, the selection, you know, picking a brush up is so subconscious to me that it doesn't even occur to me to mention it when I do it. Mm -hmm. And I, I should because that's people who are watching the video. What did you use the angle brush for? 
Um, the background, I use it when I or on here. I use it when I've got an edge because I can turn it sideways and cut in around something. Uh, I find it very useful for that. Uh, this is a good thing to know. When you're traveling up to an edge that's making a right turn, make these lines travel along the surface, never directly toward you, travel along the surface at an angle, and then when they get to that edge, make them drop straight down. Because that will help uh, immensely with that illusion that uh, this thing is traveling around the form. Now, I think personally, no matter who wants to admit this or not, that um, there's a tremendous amount of faux finishing that happens in painting. It's tremendous. Uh, there's a guy named, uh, and those of you who took my last workshop and were uh, almost brain damaged by the number of slides. <laughs> They know me at Epson Projector now mm -hmm. and uh, don't like me all that much. Uh, so far, remember my projector died? Yes. yes. I'm on my third projector from those people. Really? Yeah. They keep re uh, replacing the projectors. Yeah, I'm not real happy. I mean, on the one hand, it's okay because they are they are at least replacing them. But, uh, you know, I don't think they understand that when I do... When I do a slide presentation, it goes on and on and on. People die during my slide presentation. <laughs> so uh, these folks at Epson, Epson just don't quite know what to make of that. And uh, do you keep having the same reoccurring problem? Yes, it keeps burning it out. It's uh, it kills too long. Oh yeah, it does. I love that. Um, but there's a, a guy who was on that last one, if you were awake when I got to him, <laughs> named Ken Davies. Oh, yeah. And uh, he's absolutely wonderful. But if you really look at his paintings, there's a lot of faux finish uh, in, his, in his, just generally speaking, in his work. So it wouldn't hurt you to have one of those, just to literally get a book on how to do faux finish. Because it sort of looks like marble. You know, I, I go for uh, your viewers, generally speaking, uh, are cooperative people. You know, they want you to succeed too. So. Um, if you give them just enough information to have a suspicion that something is, you know, wood grain or whatever, they go on with it. They're not trying to hurt you. Is it? Yay, me! Because up here it looks like hell. No, it's not Up here it's not good. It's sort of awful. Love doing faux finishing, and he said, "Oh, faux finishing is just a good paint job gone bad." <laughs> <laughs> Happy accident. I laughed. I laughed. Yeah. <laughs> um, now I have uh, a preference in my paintings, truly, for hiding, um, uh, either completely hiding my signatures. Or, and you'll notice this with Ken Davies too, uh, Melendez, uh, 18th century uh, Spanish painter, goes all the way back to um, the Venetian painters, use something called a cartolino. I love this. And it is a painting where there will be a piece of paper laying on this, and my signature will be on the piece of paper. Uh, to me, signing this thing uh, is awful. You know, you try to convince people that they're looking at something and then there's this signature floating in the air. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I hate that. And the smaller the painting is, the more I hate it. So what I would do uh, is, you know, carve my, carve my initials or carve my name 
into um, into the front face of this so that it's not uh, so obvious. Uh, and this is really not what I would consider to be the finished painting, but so I would do more with the the uh, pith coming in on those little wedgy things. Uh, so I can't, you know, it ain't cooperating. Also, I, I found on, and you'll see it on this one, I came back and hit, I can do that, I think, right now. Because I came back and hit uh, with just alizarin crimson. Right around that outside edge. Can you see that little bit of difference there? Yes. This is really my favorite part of the painting because this is the part where you get to finesse it. You know, put all the little tiny details in. I, I love giving the viewer a reason to walk up and, and spend some, some more time looking. You put and the alizarin in the center? Yeah, just on one side of the center, because I'm trying to make it look a little darker on that side. Uh, and then darkening that outside U shape. You can see how, how, what that's going to do. I'm not going to take the time to do it now. But, uh, what else? Oh, oh, wait. Now, here, I'm working with the same palette, right? I can take some yellow and put some blue-black. I'm taking the chrome yellow. And the chrome yellow and the blue-black will give you some kind of green. And I will put that little uh, stem in up here, you can really truly finesse this to whatever degree you want. Uh, I could come back and slightly darken around that little opening. Down. It's too wet for, for me to be able to be very successful with it. The other thing I can do, because this is a pink grapefruit, is I can put areas of blush. Yeah, you can see it. I have it on that other. I wipe out the brush, put some paint on there. It's just like when you take your lipstick and do this, mm -hmm. and then you smear it around. It's the same thing. Put some color on there and then tap that in. In order to get those sort of pinky, almost splotchy things. I'm going to try cad red light because that's not. Yeah, this is better. Try just cad red light on your blushy part should be some place in the book where I talk about adding blush to the painting. Yeah, I think that, that cad red light works a little bit better. Plus you make it less monochromatic, just a little bit more color to it. Yes, I think so. And also by very varying the color on the outside, uh, it looks a little bit more natural and uh, uh, less like a rubber ball. That's, you know, going to be a problem. Um, let's see if this helps. Now, you never just smack a highlight on and leave it alone. You have to put a highlight on and then work the edges of it so that it sort of works in. By tapping around the edges of a highlight like that, it marries the highlight to the surface so that it doesn't look like there's just a, a smear of white paint floating in front of the surface. 
Would that be true of an animal's eye? Or you just an animal's eye. Just uh, an animal's eye, you can just you can just hit it, or mm -hmm. or a piece of glass that's not real close to you. Uh, uh, if you get a book by a realist painter that you really like, go through the entire book from start to finish and look at every single highlight, just the highlights. Mm -hmm. That's how you learn from a book. You don't go through it and look at the whole painting just as a whole. You have to analyze those paintings. Um, you, know, you go through one once and you say, how do they handle the highlights? Then you go through once and say, okay, how did they handle the color? So you look at one element of the painting at a time. Mary, if we're not done, we must be close to it. One minute. <laughs> Ta-da! Uh, okay.